Hello, welcome to vlog number 10. It's been nine months since the last vlog because I've been so busy, but there are a few things I wanted to talk about, so here it is. In this one, I'll be talking about some changes to the new workshop, some changes to the content and the monetization of the YouTube channel, and Tool Talk featuring the Record Power Air Filtration Unit, and an interesting story about my broken Merca D-Ross sander and how I managed to get it fixed. Just before we jump into the workshop changes, I just wanted to update you on a few projects coming soon to the channel. First, there'll be one about our new shoe, hat and coat storage for the entrance hall. That video should be up next week, I hope. And there'll be a video about how we made our new kitchen worktops. All that coming soon to the channel. Now, over to Keith in the workshop. Thanks, Keith. I just wanted to talk about some observations since moving into this larger workshop and some of the changes that I'll be making. When I designed the layout of the workshop, I thought I had a pretty good idea about how I would use the space, but I'm finding that I'm not using it as expected. For example, I thought that I would be spending most of my time in the workshop at my main workbench here, and that's why I put all of my main tools on the tool wall right next to it. But what I'm finding is that I tend to be doing most of my work here in the center of the workshop at the large MFT table, which I built in a recent project video. What's also interesting is that I'm not really making use of the MFT top on this table as much as I thought I would. Using an MFT and a track saw is definitely a great solution for making cuts to large sheet materials, and it's a great alternative to a table saw in many situations too. I also think if I had much less space to work in, that an MFT and track saw would be much more valuable than perhaps a table saw, but while I have access to a table saw and a mitre saw, I just find personally that I gravitate towards using them wherever possible. It just seems quicker and easier and less clunky. Now it could be that I'm just doing what I'm used to, but yeah, in general I'm finding that the MFT top is getting loads of use as a general table top, but not as much use as far as the MFT holes are concerned. I'm still going to persevere with it and it's great to have the option of using it and it does come in handy from time to time, but yeah, I'm just noticing that I'm not using it as much as I thought I would. Another thing that I've noticed is that having my table saw on a mobile base and my workbench in front of it doubling up as an outfeed table doesn't feel like the best use of the space that I have available anymore. It worked great in my old workshop, but less so here. So I'm starting to think about designing a large bench to incorporate the table saw, extension tables, and an outfeed table, all as one large mobile workstation. The thing that's holding me back is that I'm still not sure if I want to upgrade my table saw, so I don't want to spend loads of time designing and building something around a tool that I may or may not keep going forward. Not sure what to do about that one yet. In terms of timber storage, one thing that is working really well is the wood storage at the front between the rolling garage door and the wall that I installed a few months ago. That's working great. What isn't working so well is my timber storage of smaller pieces. I put most of them in this metal rack that was here when I moved in, left by the previous occupants. And sifting through this rack just doesn't feel like the most efficient way to find things. I actually prefer how I was storing smaller pieces of timber at my old workshop, so I've already been making some plans for what I'm going to build to solve that issue. And I think I've come up with quite a clever and efficient solution. So stay tuned as that will be a future build project. I've recently installed some rubber matting to my workshop floor mainly to make things easier on my feet and legs because I've noticed that standing on a concrete floor all day is quite fatiguing and I found that I could only work for maybe five or six hours before getting quite achy. Maybe I'm just getting old or something, I'm not sure. Anyway, these rubber mats have made a huge difference. I can now work for much longer. And also if I drop things on the floor, they are less likely to break. You can see one of the casualties I've had already. My favorite Stanley block plane is now injured. The project to install this matting didn't go smoothly at all. It was a bit of a nightmare, but I'll go into more detail on that in a future video that I'll be putting together all about it. Another thing I've noticed is that airborne dust is much less of a problem in a larger workspace than it is in a smaller workshop. Maybe that's quite obvious, but it's not something that had occurred to me until working here. It's just an observation and I don't want to upset anyone in a smaller workspace. I know I'm very, very lucky to have a workshop as big as this, but yeah, in my old workshop, you could really notice how the dust just kind of floats around and lingers in the air, but in a larger space with higher ceilings, it just seems to disperse better, I guess. 
Even so, I have now installed a new air filtration unit, which is up there. And by the way, I'll talk about that later in the video in the tool talk section. There are also a few bits of organization that I need to do. I put up these shelves a while back and they just keep gathering clutter, which is making it tricky to find things. So I need to sort that out. I've also made some storage solutions for my rolls of tape, drill bits, paper towels and battery chargers and all of that will be featured in a future video too. I need to have the electrical supply to the workshop upgraded. Apparently the cable that runs from the house to the workshop isn't big enough to serve the equipment that I'm running here and I've noticed that if I run for example my thickness planer and an extractor at the same time you can kind of hear the machine struggling to draw enough power if that makes sense. Also the consumer unit as you can see is pretty ancient so that needs to be upgraded too. And finally I need more sockets. At the moment I have five double sockets that are live in the workshop and I've had five extra double sockets installed. Three of them along the wall where my mitre station is and two on this central pillar behind me here which I'll run my table saw from along with any corded power tools that I might need to use in the centre of the workshop. Channel changes. There's a couple of things I want to cover here. First, the content on the channel, and secondly, some sponsorship and money related stuff. On the content side of things, I've noticed recently that my project videos are performing quite badly. Meanwhile, any workshop or tool related videos that I'm making are performing really well. And the curious thing about that is that when I've asked for feedback about what you guys want to see on the channel, the response is predominantly that you want to see project videos. This isn't a problem that's specific to my channel. I know that John Heiss has talked about this before on the I Build It channel. And I've also chatted with some of my UK based YouTube maker friends and they are experiencing exactly the same thing. Project videos performing badly in comparison with other content. This is problematic for me for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the project videos take much, much longer to make. So it can be pretty disheartening when you spend several days working on filming and editing a project video to find it performing badly in comparison to a video which maybe took a couple of hours to script, a couple of hours to film and a few hours editing. Secondly, when a video performs badly, it drags the performance of the channel down because the YouTube algorithm tends to only promote channels where the latest videos are performing well. So when you put out a video that doesn't get many views, the performance of the channel suffers. This is a tricky thing for me because I want to make project videos predominantly on this channel and I'm also hearing from you that that's what you want to see but on the other hand they take much more time to produce and they seem to be dragging my channel's performance down a bit. I haven't really decided what direction to take things in yet but it's looking likely that I will need to start diversifying my content a bit more. Now onto the money side of things. I might make a follow-up video to the how much money am I making video I put out a while back let me know if that's something that you want to see. I've had a bad year in terms of the business. The main reason for that is because I've been spending more time setting up the new workshop and doing house renovations and less time doing woodworking commissions and client work. And as a result of that, I've earned less this year from the business than I did last year. I've been offered some really generous sponsorship offers lately, which I've turned down because I feel like talking about things like mobile phone games for 60 seconds at the start of my videos would be really detrimental to my content and I know that most of you won't want to see that either and even though I know a lot of other much larger woodworking channels than mine are accepting those kind of offers I just don't feel comfortable with it on this channel. I'm not against sponsorships but I would probably only do it if it was A related to the content on my channel or B if it was a product that I felt that I could genuinely endorse. But in the five years I've been running this channel, I've had numerous offers, but I've only ever done one sponsored video so far. And that was a sponsor from a tool company with tools that I really like. So that was kind of an easy decision. I've turned down every other sponsorship offer I've ever had. The alternative to taking on sponsors in my videos is for me to keep pushing the Patreon side of things and making more exclusive videos, which seems to be working really well as the exclusive videos have been well received, there's been a huge boost in patrons to the channel and I've mostly had overwhelming positive support for them. So a big thank you to everyone supporting me in doing that. But I've also had a bit of a backlash of negativity about me daring to try and earn a living at doing this. The way I see it, there are three options. I can do the Patreon exclusive thing and hope that that continues to work or I can start taking sponsorships that may or may not have any relation to the content on my channel. 
or I can do nothing and not earn enough money for the hours that I put into this to make it all worthwhile. Okay, that's enough about that. Now it's time for Tool Talk. So over to Keith again in the workshop. Thanks again, Keith. First up, I have a new air filtration unit. Some of you may remember in my old workshop, I was using the Thor TF470 and I did a review about that unit on my channel. That machine didn't really have enough capacity to be able to serve this new workshop because it's so much bigger. So I needed to upgrade and I've been keeping an eye out for one for a few months, looking to buy one second hand. And I managed to win one of the record power AC400 units on eBay for about a hundred pounds. Unfortunately, when it arrived, it didn't have the remote control with it. Originally, I thought that wasn't going to be an issue because I was planning to set it up on a smart plug anyway so that I can use voice control activation via Google Home to turn it on and off, which is what I did with the Thor unit at my old workshop. But that's not possible. I can turn it off okay, but I can't turn it on via a smart plug and Based on what it says in the manual, I think that's due to the machine being designed to protect the user against automatic starting of the machine when power is restored after a power failure. In other words, I think that powering it off via a smart plug makes the machine think that there's been a power failure, so it won't turn on again until you physically press the on button on the machine itself. So that's pretty annoying. If anyone knows of a workaround for that, please do let me know in the comments. Because the machine is mounted on quite a high ceiling and I don't have a remote control and I can't find a replacement one available to buy online either, I have to use a pokey stick to turn it on and off. I positioned the air filter two thirds along the wall opposite the door of my workshop which having done a bit of research online about the best placement of these machines seems to be the most optimum position to make it run most efficiently. My favorite thing about it is how quiet it is. Even on top speed, it's much, much quieter than the Thor filtration unit I used previously. I'll demonstrate that now. So I'm standing about a meter and a half away from the microphone right now, talking in my normal voice, and the filter is on its low speed at the moment. This is the medium speed. And this is the high speed, so I think you'll agree it's pretty quiet. It seems to work really well. I can see that a lot of airborne dust has already been collected by the filters. So yeah, I'm really happy with it so far, aside from the lack of remote control and the awkwardness of turning the unit on and off. Just so that you're aware, in case you're considering buying one of these machines, this machine is exactly the same model as those sold by other manufacturers like Rutland's and WEM in the United States, which are often available to buy much cheaper than the one with the record power branding on it. So if you're looking for one of these, definitely shop around because you can often get the same machine for much less money. If you check out the My Tools link in the description box below this video, you'll find some of the alternative models listed on there. Some of you may remember that in a previous video, I talked about my favorite and very expensive, by the way, random orbit sander, the Merca DROS, breaking down. It would not power on. I had heard from a few people, including Matt at Badger Workshop, who had a problem with his too, that the reliability of this tool leaves a lot to be desired, which for such an expensive tool is really disappointing. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it and I raved about it in my review video, but if it isn't as reliable as it should be, then that has me doubting whether I should keep it or not because reliability for me is one of the most important things I look for in a tool. When you spend that kind of money on a tool, you want it to work flawlessly for many, many years. So for it to fail so quickly is a bit of a concern. Anyway, I just wanted to talk you through the process of getting it repaired because it was quite an interesting course of events. The tool comes with a three year warranty, so it was well within warranty as far as I was concerned. So I wrote to the authorized Merca repair center asking if there was anything else I could do to test why it wasn't working. They responded saying I'd need to send it to them and they asked for proof of purchase, serial number and a collection address, which I provided to them. I bought it new on eBay, so I provided them with the PayPal purchase invoice. They then responded saying that the seller isn't an authorized seller of Merca products and that according to their records, they believed that I bought it second hand and that warranties are non-transferable. So I was pretty worried at this point, as you can imagine. And I wrote to the seller to ask him what was going on, although I never actually heard back from him. 
Anyway, I wrote back to the repair centre saying that I bought it brand new. It arrived in sealed packaging and it stated that the machine had a three year warranty and that I'd provided all of the requested detail that they asked for, therefore I would like it repaired. They then wrote back saying that the distributor that the machine was sold to was a company that do not sell on eBay. I responded saying I don't really see how that's my problem, I bought it new, it's under warranty and I want it repaired. And I didn't get any response to that email, so at this point I phoned Merca themselves. I just googled their phone number and a very helpful lady answered the phone and I explained the situation to her. She said she'd look into it for me. A few minutes later the repair centre wrote back to me saying that Merca had authorised the collection and repair under warranty and that they would collect the tool the very next day. So in hindsight Merca were very helpful in sorting this out for me which is great. I'm still not 100% sure if technically it should be covered by their warranty or not but as far as I'm concerned I'm a consumer, I bought it new, it said it had a three year warranty and I want that three year warranty. It took the repair centre just over a week to repair and return it to me and the repair note that came back said motor loose, fixed and balanced. So that was obviously the issue with it. It also looks like it's had a new speed controller fitted. I'm not sure why, but yeah, since then it's been working fine. That's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already for more weekly woodworking videos. If you want to, you can also support the channel on Patreon where you can get early access to my videos, some exclusive content, free project plans and cut lists, and a name credit at the end of my videos. Thank you for watching.